Volume One, Chapter One of Marius the Epicurean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marius the Epicurean by Walter Pater. Volume One, Chapter One. The Religion of Numa. As in the triumph of Christianity, the old religion lingered latest in the country, and died out at last as but paganism, the religion of the villagers, before the advance of the Christian church, so, in an earlier century, it was in places remote from town life, that the older and purer forms of paganism itself had survived the longest. While in Rome new religions had arisen with bewildering complexity around the dying old one, the earlier and simpler patriarchal religion, the religion of Numa, as people loved to fancy, lingered on with little change amid the pastoral life, out of the habits and sentiment of which so much of it had grown. Glimpses of such a survival we may catch below the merely artificial attitudes of Latin pastoral poetry, in Tibullus especially, who has preserved for us many poetic details of old Roman religious usage. At mihi contingat patrios celebrare penates, redere quantiquo menstruatura lari, he prays with unaffected seriousness. Something liturgical, with repetitions of a consecrated form of words, is traceable in one of his elegies, as part of the order of a birthday sacrifice. The hearth, from a spark of which, as one form of old legend related, the child Romulus had been miraculously born, was still indeed an altar, and the worthiest sacrifice to the gods the perfect physical sanity of the young men and women, which the scrupulous ways of that religion of the hearth had tended to maintain. A religion of usages and sentiment rather than of facts and belief, and attached to very definite things and places. The oak of immemorial age, the rock on the heath fashioned by weather, as if by some dim human art, the shadowy grove of ilex, passing into which one exclaimed involuntarily in consecrated phrase, Deity is in this place, Numen in est. It was in natural harmony with the temper of a quiet people, amid the spectacle of rural life, like that simpler faith between man and man, which Tibullus expressly connects with the period when, with an inexpensive worship, the old wooden gods had been still pressed for room, in their homely little shrines. And about the time when the dying Antoninus Pius ordered his golden image of fortune to be carried into the chamber of his successor, now about to test the truth of the old platonic contention that the world would at last find itself happy, could it detach some reluctant philosophic student from the more desirable life of celestial contemplation, and compel him to rule it. There was a boy living in an old country house, half farm, half villa, who, for himself, recruited that body of antique traditions by a spontaneous force of religious veneration, such as had originally called them into being. More than a century and a half had passed since Tibullus had written, but the restoration of religious usages, and their retention where they still survived, was meantime come to be the fashion through the influence of imperial example, and what had been in the main a matter of family pride with his father, was sustained by a native instinct of devotion in the young Marius. A sense of conscious powers external to ourselves, pleased or displeased by the right or wrong conduct of every circumstance of daily life, that conscience, of which the old Roman religion was a formal, habitual recognition, was become in him a powerful current of feeling and observance. The old-fashioned, partly puritanic awe, 
the power of which, Wordsworth noted and valued so highly in a northern peasantry, had its counterpart in the feeling of the Roman lad, as he passed the spot, touched of heaven, where the lightning had struck dead an aged labourer in the field. An upright stone, still with mouldering garlands about it, marked the place. He brought to that system of symbolic usages, and they in turn developed in him further, a great seriousness, an impressibility to the sacredness of time, of life and its events, and the circumstances of family fellowship, of such gifts to men as fire, water, the earth, from labour on which they live, really understood by him as gifts, a sense of religious responsibility in the reception of them. It was a religion for the most part of fear, of multitudinous scruples, of a year-long burden of forms. Yet rarely, on clear summer mornings, for instance, the thought of those heavenly powers afforded a welcome channel for the almost stifling sense of health and delight in him, and relieved it as gratitude to the gods. The day of the little or private Ambarwalia was come, to be celebrated by a single family for the welfare of all belonging to it, as the great college of the Arval brothers officiated at Rome in the interest of the whole state. At the appointed time all work ceases. The instruments of labour lie untouched, hung with wreaths of flowers, while masters and servants together go in solemn procession along the dry paths of vineyard and cornfield, conducting the victims whose blood is presently to be shed for the purification from all natural or supernatural taint of the lands they have gone about. The old Latin words of the liturgy, to be said as the procession moved on its way, though their precise meaning was long since become unintelligible, were recited from an ancient illuminated roll kept in the painted chest in the hall, together with the family records. Early on that day, the girls of the farm had been busy in the great portico, filling large baskets with flowers plucked short from branches of apple and cherry, then in spacious bloom, to strew before the quaint images of the gods, Ceres and Bacchus, and the yet more mysterious Dea Dea as they passed through the fields, carried in their little houses on the shoulders of white-clad youths, who were understood to proceed to this office in perfect temperance, as pure in soul and body as the air they breathed in the firm weather of that early summer-time. The clean lustral water and the full incense-box were carried after them. The altars were gay with garlands of wool, and the more sumptuous sort of blossom, and green herbs to be thrown into the sacrificial fire, fresh gathered this morning from a particular plot in the old garden set apart for the purpose. Just then the young leaves were almost as fragrant as flowers, and the scent of the bean-fields mingled pleasantly with the cloud of incense. But for the monotonous intonation of the liturgy by the priests, clad in their strange, stiff, antique vestments, and bearing ears of green corn upon their heads, secured by flowing bands of white, the procession moved in absolute stillness, all persons, even the children, abstaining from speech after the utterance of the pontifical formula, Fawete linguis, silence, propitious silence, lest any words, save those proper to the occasion, should hinder the religious efficacy of the rite. With the lad Marius, who, as the head of his house, took a leading part in the ceremonies of the day, there was a devout effort to complete this impressive outward silence by that inward tacitness of mind, esteemed so important by religious Romans, in the performance of these sacred functions. To him the sustained stillness without seemed really but to be waiting upon that interior mental condition of preparation or expectancy, for which he was just then so intently striving. The persons about him, certainly, had never been challenged by those prayers and ceremonies to any ponderings on the divine nature, 
they conceived them rather to be the appointed means of setting such troublesome movements at rest. By them, the religion of Numa, so staid, ideal, and comely, the object of so much jealous conservatism, though of direct service as lending sanction to a sort of high scrupulosity, especially in the chief points of domestic conduct, was mainly prized as being, through its hereditary character, something like a personal distinction, as contributing, among the other accessories of an ancient house, to the production of that aristocratic atmosphere which separated them from newly made people. But in the young Marius, the very absence from those venerable usages of all definite history and dogmatic interpretation, had already awakened much speculative activity, and to-day, starting from the actual details of the divine service, some very lively surmises, though scarcely distinct enough to be thoughts, were moving backwards and forwards in his mind, as the stirring wind had done all day among the trees, and were like the passing of some mysterious influence over all the elements of his nature and experience. One thing only distracted him, a certain pity at the bottom of his heart, and almost on his lips, for the sacrificial victims, and their looks of terror, rising almost to disgust at the central act of the sacrifice itself, a piece of everyday butcher's work, such as we decorously hide out of sight, though some then present certainly displayed a frank curiosity in the spectacle, thus permitted them on a religious pretext. The old sculptors of the great procession on the frieze of the Parthenon at Athens have delineated the placid heads of the victims led in to sacrifice, with a perfect feeling for animals in forcible contrast with any indifference as to their sufferings. It was this contrast that distracted Marius now in the blessing of his fields, and qualified his devout absorption upon the scrupulous fulfilment of all the details of the ceremonial as the procession approached the altars. The names of that great populace of little gods, dear to the Roman home, which the pontiffs had placed on the sacred list of the Indicitamenta, to be invoked, because they can help, on special occasions, were not forgotten in the long litany. Vatican, who causes the infant to utter his first cry, Fabulinus, who prompts his first word, Cuba, who keeps him quiet in his cot, Domiduca especially, for whom Marius had through life a particular memory and devotion, the goddess who watches over one's safe coming home. The urns of the dead in the family chapel received their due service. They also were now become something divine, a goodly company of friendly and protecting spirits, encamped about the place of their former abode. Above all others, the father, dead ten years before, of whom, remembering but a tall, grave figure above him in early childhood, Marius habitually thought as a genius a little cold and severe. Candidus in suetum miratur limen olympi, sub pedibus que videt nubes et sidera. Perhaps, but certainly needs his altar here below, and garlands to-day upon his urn. But the dead genii were satisfied with little, a few violets, a cake dipped in wine, or a morsel of honeycomb. Daily from the time when his childish footsteps were still uncertain, had Marius taken them their portion of the family meal, at the second course, amidst the silence of the company. They loved those who brought them their sustenance, but, deprived of these services, would be heard wandering through the house, crying sorrowfully in the stillness of the night. And those simple gifts, like other objects as trivial, bread, oil, wine, milk, had regained for him by their use in such religious service, that poetic, and as it were moral, significance, which surely belongs to all the means of daily life could we but break through the veil of our familiarity with things by no means vulgar in themselves. A hymn followed while the whole assembly stood with veiled faces. The fire rose up readily from the altars in clean bright flame, a favourable omen, 
making it a duty to render the mirth of the evening complete. Old wine was poured out freely for the servants at supper in the great kitchen, where they had worked in the imperfect light through the long evenings of winter. The young Marius himself took but a very sober part in the noisy feasting, a devout, regretful aftertaste of what had been really beautiful in the ritual he had accomplished took him early away, that he might the better recall in reverie all the circumstances of the celebration of the day. As he sank into a sleep, pleasant with all the influences of long hours in the open air, he seemed still to be moving in procession through the fields, with a kind of pleasurable awe. That feeling was still upon him as he awoke amid the beating of violent rain on the shutters in the first storm of the season. The thunder which startled him from sleep seemed to make the solitude of his chamber almost painfully complete, as if the nearness of those angry clouds shut him up in a close place alone in the world. Then he thought of the sort of protection which that day's ceremonies assured to procure an agreement with the gods, parcem deorum ex poscere, that was the meaning of what they had all day been busy upon. In a faith, sincere but half-suspicious, he would fain have those powers at least not against him. His own nearer household gods were all around his bed, the spell of his religion, as a part of the very essence of home, its intimacy, its dignity and security, was forcible at that moment. Only it seemed to involve certain heavy demands upon him. End of chapter 1